So my, my comments are necessarily going to be at a, a relatively high level and trying to think through um, what the impact of various policy changes that occurred in Ontario over the past decade or so have been on trying to move in the direction of complete communities, complete streets, active transportation, because these were all things, as we'll see, were, act, were very explicitly identified as policy goals in terms of the types of things uh, the province was doing. And we, one of the subtexts here where we started from was that there was a, a urban-suburban divide about these things, and we had seen some of that in some of the research I had done at the Canada Institute, in the Canada Institute uh, in my earlier life before I became an academic. In particular, we did a community sustainability uh, assessment report in 2007, and a couple of things there became very apparent. If you looked at the outer ring municipalities, the GTA, uh, Peel, Halt, and York, Durham, uh, what you got there was a very clear picture of they were doing extremely well in economic terms, were variations on the theme of a disaster in terms of urban form. Uh, there was indeed to the point that I think there was some recognition of the possibility of negative feedback loops in terms of, of the poor urban form, the transportation patterns that were going with that, and their ability to continue their economic prosperity. At the other end of the scale, the large cities, Toronto and Ottawa, generally did very well across the board. But interesting, again, this kind of undermines a little bit the, the notion there's a, a pure urban city versus outer divide. Um, places like Stratford and Wealth also did extremely well in terms of our overall criteria, and particularly in effectively in, in providing what we would recognize as, as a form of complete community. That's kind of a starting point for thinking this one through in terms of therefore where we ended up now and where we need to get to. The context for this is that between 2004 and 2006, the province undertook something of a, a revolution. I think, I think by far uh, the most ambitious program of legislative and policy change uh, the province has ever seen in terms of land use planning and infrastructure planning and the integration of the two, the creation of the Ministry of um, Inf Public Infrastructure Renewal was part of that, places to grow plan, the Green Belt, uh, revisions to the Planning Act, the policy statement, uh, the big move and creation of Netflix also were woven together uh, in, in very, very degrees of planned and unplanned ways. Clearly, though very strong, subtext of all of this was this theme of creating complete communities. Uh, um, active transportation comes up in a number of different ways of integrating, uh, mixing of land uses, reduce automobile dependency. So, Part of what we now need to do is to think through uh, these policies are put in place. To a certain degree, we've started to see responses from municipalities in terms of conformity amendments to the growth plan and to the green belt plan and to the revisions to the PPS. So it's kind of a good time to be starting to step back and say, well, what did we get? Where did we get to? Uh, are we getting the results that we expected? And are there mid-course adjustments that we need to make? One of the problems with doing this is, in fact, that, that nobody has actually undertaken that kind of an assessment in any kind of a systemic way. Indeed, my remarks are very much based on an agglomeration of, of bits and pieces from all kinds of different people. This is why I'm encouraging the province to do this as well. Uh, so there's, if you read NRU regularly, you sort of get bits and pieces of what's going on in individual municipalities. There's been stuff from the Neptis Foundation. There's been things from the Greenbelt Alliance. Uh, there's been stuff, particularly Finger, uh, Finger's piece in the Toronto Star, which, which I was very interested in because it struck me as, as the first sort of real attempt by anybody to make some sense of what came out of the conformity exercises. Uh, one of the things that came through there too, though, was, was the extent to which uh, some of that became a numbers exercise, and really which we've assessed conformity in a, in a formal way. It's been, you know, do, do have they have municipalities lined up with the density and intensification targets? We've, we've not really got very much in terms of any sort of finer grain analysis in terms of the quality of, of what we've actually got in the outcome and how they actually responded. And so there are pieces also from students in our own programs and at other universities, but there's, there's very little in, in sort of any kind of systemic analysis. So here's an attempt at that, and, and I invite comment and criticism and disagreement, uh, but here's the best we can do so far. Uh, the degree in which there's a split, it's, it's less urban and, or, or suburban urban and more along the lines of the inner and outer belts on either side of the green belt in terms of the responses that we've got. 
Uh, in terms of the inner belt, the municipalities inside the green belt, principally what we used to refer to as the GTA municipalities, the city of Toronto and the, uh, the four surrounding uh, municipalities, uh, regional municipalities. A um, number of different dimensions to this. One of the things that was there was a lot of concern about and had implications in terms of what sorts of urban form we're going to get was this process of, of carving up what was known as the white belt which was the area of land left between the planned, uh, the, the areas which were already zoned for urbanization and the inner boundary of the Green Belt. And what we got, I think, has been less of a horror than some people were expecting. Uh, consumption of the White Belt and the conformity exercises has run somewhere between 9 and 24 percent. It averages out about 18 percent of the total, so not quite the catastrophe that we expected. And indeed, if, if we continue on this path, effectively have left, uh, in the words of one now analyst, uh, enough land supply for generations of growth uh, to come. So we are, we are not under particular pressures uh, to leapfrog over the green belt for those reasons. The other theme that seems to be emerging is that, that said, uh, that achieving the density targets for greenfield development are turning out to be more of a problem than intensification. And this seems to be driven by a couple of things. One is employment lands and the way in which we have defined employment lands. And unfortunately, much of the use that we're getting there is, is very, very low density. We're getting a lot of warehouse and distribution activities and parts are tied up with structural changes in the Ontario economy. You get things that look like this that occupy a very, very large footprint and employ virtually no one. Um, the Growth Secretariat has made some very useful efforts at trying to parse this concept of employment lands a little bit more and to sort of separate out the sorts of things that actually really need to be separated from other land uses relative to the things that we actually should be trying to mix in with other land uses. If we're trying to create complete communities, have uh, transportation options other than the automobile, it's especially important given that the actual types of, of industrial activities where you actually really need to separate them from other land uses are getting less and less significant in Ontario all the time. We have less and less of that. So that's when rationale is kind of falling away. I actually think there's, there is considerable room here for municipalities and the province to be a little more creative about what's happening with employment lands and employment land planning. I'll come back to that later. 